Thank you very much, Carol. And good afternoon. Um, this has been a long afternoon for everyone, so I hope we can keep it reasonably interesting for you. Heritage Hong Kong, just to give a quick background and then sort of where I come from, is a not-for-profit a not -for -profit organization with charitable status in Hong Kong. Quite recent, and that probably tells you something about the way heritage has been looked at in Hong Kong uh, until quite recently. Our focus is on conservation of all types of heritage assets, not just the built environment. We like to think that heritage is historical, cultural, social, architectural, all these things, and that they all need to be taken into consideration when deciding what comprises heritage, and I'll get into that in a minute. This based on national trusts that have been established elsewhere in the world, where members, we have lots of members, we have members, we're accountable to the public, etc. But the thing is really, at the moment, at the stage of development of heritage conservation in Hong Kong, is where something, I suppose another activist, uh, trying to get people to debate the issues, trying to decide probably, and find out probably, what really is regarded as heritage in Hong Kong. Since 1997, and obviously that's an important date, the community at large in Hong Kong has taken increasing interest in our disappearing heritage. I think it's been referred to by other speakers. Since the handover, there's been a sense of belonging that has developed in Hong Kong. Our people are looking for reference points, and they're no longer looking at Hong Kong as a way an exit point to somewhere else, which they think might be better. I think a lot of people now are happy with Hong Kong, regarded as a long-term home, and want to bring up their family there. And this gives a very different attitude to what sort of life and what sort of lifestyle they want their family to enjoy. And that is really one of the issues that is now being considered, is what is heritage in the city? Who should decide what it is? And how should it be conserved? Our Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, which was established in 1976 under rather different circumstances, has a very narrow definition of built heritage as being historical architectural significance. And has been alluded to by Christine and by Peter and Nick. There's no provision under any of our statutory legislation to recognize clusters of buildings or neighborhoods or streetscapes or the markets, which we've been spending a lot of time recently trying to conserve, or customs or festivals, a lot of which a lot of people in Hong Kong think of as our heritage. It's also been quite interesting. Collective memory, which I know a lot of people in the industry, in heritage business, don't like as a phrase, but it's what it's called in Hong Kong, social heritage. It seems particularly important to our society, and that's perhaps because we probably haven't got a lot, really, in that a lot of the people who live in Hong Kong were immigrants, were refugees, had to leave behind their own collective memory, and would like to see some established in Hong Kong. And really, the Star Ferry discussions last year, that year before, Queen's Pier, that's focused a lot of attention on collective memory and how you actually conserve it when it's neither of architectural or historical significance under our ordinance. As you can see, Queen's Pier is not probably very architecturally beautiful or significant, but when it was proposed that it was going to be demolished um, as part of the uh, work on the harbour front and the reclamation that we've all been fighting so hard not to have any more of, there really was a terrific movement in Hong Kong to have it conserved. And in the end, it has been taken down in one of our, Peter referred to another one, piece by piece, and stored away. And there's now great discussion as to where it should be rebuilt on the harbour front, or not, as the case may be. But that's still under discussion at the moment, where it will go back. Presently, buildings need to be declared monuments in order to be protected. We have three forms of listing under the old ordinance. Uh, grade one, grade two, grade three. But even grade one is not enough to protect a building. It has to be declared a, a monument. We have 85 monuments at the present out of 
600 plus buildings graded. Only 17 monuments been declared since 1999, so we've had somewhat of a slowdown in declaration of monuments, which has probably got something to do with the amount of development going on in Hong Kong, and quite a lot of us think the government's not terribly keen on having more monuments because they get in the way on occasions. To date, some 54 graded buildings have been demolished, at least five of them grade one, and uh, it's a continual fight to try and maybe maintain and conserve the better of our buildings and heritage in Hong Kong. The administrative structure is somewhat confusing, and this probably accounts for some of the difficulties. Development Bureau now is responsible for development-related heritage, and I have to say, if other people can actually explain to me what that is, I think it would be helpful. But that's what they're responsible for, and the Secretary of Development, who will be here later, is the Antiquities Authority under the Ordinance and has really quite a lot of power in declaring, well, the only person who can declare a monument. The Antiquities Monuments Office, which is sort of really the uh, department which looks after the practical side of things, remains under the Home Affairs Bureau. And Natural Heritage falls under Agricultural Fisheries and Conservation Department, which comes under the Food and Health Bureau. So you can see it does get a bit confusing. There really is a need, and I think it, ha it is becoming now, uh, for a clear commitment to conservation by government. And I think they have begun to realise that this has become quite important to the community in Hong Kong. We do need to, re well, we do need to completely rewrite the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, and I think there is an acceptance of that, but they just don't want to do it quite yet. There have been several reviews and consultations. They've all highlighted the same issues, uh, but unfortunately some of them, I think, are a little bit inconvenient, like other things have been. And then there's also, as being referred to, trying to build in the role of the URA and urban regeneration into our heritage conservation policies, because they all are part of our planning system, and they do need to be a lot more holistic in their view. Peter had these two pictures earlier on, uh, illustrating perhaps slightly different things. There are difficulties, in, and that's why what I was saying about the conversations we have in Hong Kong, the community still hasn't really come to any real decisions, I think. Obviously, the old building, we were very pleased to see it conserved. A lot of people, perhaps, though, don't like quite what it was turned into. And this has led to quite a lot of debate about gentrification and changing old buildings into something that the community surrounding them can no longer enjoy, because this particular building is now a very up market restaurant, and a lot of the people who live in the area around Wan Chai won't be able to use it. And it's happened on two or three occasions. And although one realises that this sort of thing is going to happen when you conserve some of these buildings, and the costs involved mean they have to go to reasonably useful uh, commercial usage, uh, people are debating just what we want some of our buildings to be used for when they're conserved. Prior to last year, and I'll explain why last year was important in a minute. Uh, tourism was re really regarded by the government as a principal reason to undertake heritage conservation. They could see no real returns for conserving buildings otherwise, certainly in the urban areas, where one has to admit that because the land is very valuable, there are quite a lot of commercial uses to which the land could be put as an alternative to maintaining it as a, as a heritage asset. Consequently, property developers and development incentives were considered to be the only solutions to encourage people to conserve buildings. And that had, unfortunately, less, has led to less than optimum levels of conservation. Uh, rather more latitude was given to the developers in some cases than perhaps should have been the case to make sure that the returns were enough to encourage them to conserve most of the building, at least. And Marine Police Station which was pictured, this was taken last year, uh, has become rather a case in point. Um, it's probably, it was, a, it was a police station, it's been turned into a boutique hotel now, it's still not completed, but the premium which the developer paid for the honour of converting a police station was so high that they then had to put in a rather large underground shopping mall, which has made most, most of the hill on which it was built, and as you can see, nearly all the trees have had to be demolished, 
and there's going to be a rather limited public access to the hotel itself. But we haven't actually seen the end product, so it's perhaps not fair to comment entirely, but several of us, quite a lot of us, are rather concerned about what the end product might be. Last year, and I think with a lot of thanks to Carrie Lam, who will be speaking later, the recognition, there was recognition of, of the growing interest in the community. And the Chief Executive's policy address did include an action plan, which would address quite a lot of the issues of use, renovation, maintenance and management of vacant, publicly owned heritage buildings. The measures were for both government and private sector, but mostly government focused, under this new action plan. And its main thing was to list seven or eight, they added an extra one later, publicly owned buildings, which were put out for what was called revitalization, but really was an adaptive reuse by non-profit organizations. And it did actually come up with a way of preserving some selected historic buildings, which was the first time there'd really been a proactive policy towards this. They were transforming some of them into, they hoped, unique cultural landmarks, also some of the buildings chosen are quite difficult to turn into landmarks as such, to promote active pub public participation in conservation, which is quite important because most of the public would like a, a voice in actually what happens with the, public, the uh, publicly owned historic buildings in Hong Kong. And, and another of the government's objectives was to create job opportunities, particularly at the district level, because these are spread throughout Hong Kong. They consist of buildings, quite small buildings, most of them. Um, apart from this in Chung, which is the previous picture, this is the Tai police station. And as we look through some of these, you might think what some of the commercial uses could be, or what some of the uses could be from these buildings. They've been quite inventive, some of them. The partnership which government has been proposing is with non-profit organisations uh, that have got innovative ideas for the adaptive reuse of, designated, of these designated buildings. And then once the non-profit organisations have come up with their proposals and submitted them to government, there's then a tender amongst the interested NPOs. Uh, and there will be support and funding provided to the successful bidder by government. Quite a lot of money, a billion dollars was put aside. But the proposals for the eight initial buildings were invited in February this year. And I gather that 31 proposals were received, but unfortunately the assessments are still underway and we haven't actually seen the results of any of those yet or had any of the proposals progressed with. Although I think the government think it was a successful enough initiative because under the Chief Executive's policy address last Wednesday for 2008, we are promised another list of buildings that will come under the revitalisation programme. As you can see, they're right, varied. They go from the very small to the larger top hospital, which is really quite big. And the Blue House in Wan Chai, which is really quite small, uh, this is quite an old house. Um, it was originally gain to go through the usual route of everybody being compensated and moved out and it's going to be turned into a tourism project. But the residents objected rather strongly and wanted to be able to go back. Some of the residents had lived in this rather dilapidated building uh, for about 60, for the last 60 years and really didn't wish to be moved on. And our foundation has been helping them to approach government to try and find a way of refurbishing the building but keeping it within in residential use, with some commercial uses to help cover the costs. And this is now included in the revitalization program. Uh, we don't know whether our proposals will be accepted. Uh, several other people have done other, other proposals in, but the residents are quite happy uh, with our proposal because it means they can go back and live there. Partnership scheme process has actually been following fairly uh, traditional lines. It's a transparent, a structured and transparent procedure where all the proposals would be vetted uh, by various committees and I think that's been taking some of the time because uh, they had to then form the committee and the, the committee's been going through the various uh, proposals. There is a, a one-stop advisory service which has been set up and that will be very helpful under the new uh, Commissioner for Heritage. 
there'll be a separate secretariat to oversee the scheme so that everybody is fairly convinced it will be run in, a very, in an efficient manner. Financial support for the approved renovation plan and the first two years of operation will be provided, which will help a lot because with the NPOs they were very concerned that uh, it would take them a little time to get up and running with any commercial uses in the buildings and they may not be able to cover their costs. But after the first two years funding, they are going to have to be self-supporting. And that is obviously going to be one part of the proposals that government's considering fairly seriously. Mayo House, Nick referred to the uh, fire and check it may. This was one of the original housing authority blocks that was put up and has now been declared as a heritage asset. Uh, quite rightly in its way, but it's been quite difficult for an NPO to decide what it should be used for. It pro probably, the proposal for use as a youth hostel may well be the most successful. Also in 2007, we have further innovations. We did have a heritage conservation policy statement. There's been quite a demand for a heritage policy in Hong Kong, but this is as far as we've got. But it is a sort of a, a good start anyway. Uh, we have a commitment that will to protect and conserve heritage buildings, but we've still got um, no permanent protection for even monuments, although monuments themselves actually haven't been demolished for some years. And there's details, no details as yet, as to what or how further initiatives might be implemented. And we think that there needs to be a little bit further commitment now, because primarily administrative means are being used for improved conservation, rather, and that means a reactive action every time, rather than having a consistent approach that everybody who's concerned with heritage conservation would sort of know how the system would work and what might be conserved and what might not be. We do, all government projects now have to conduct a heritage impact assessment, which is a very welcome start, but really we'd like to see it extended to all major private projects as well. A post of commissioner for heritage was established, and that has to be a good thing, although uh, they're still being set up and recruiting their resources. There's an increase in transparency of the um, Antiquities Advisory Board, but the Antiquities Advisory Board is unfortunately an advisory board and has little no power, little power of its own. Uh, it, it, it grades buildings, but it, uh, so far, but it's not the person, it's not the authority, sorry, who then confirms uh, monuments. Uh, so it, it, its advice is by no means always taken. But we, so far we've got no review of ordinance, which I think probably a lot of people in Hong Kong think is needed. There's no rationalisation of relevant planning and development and heritage legislation, which would help considerably in, in conservation work. We've got no heritage conservation trust, which is publicly supported, as it's very much a private effort. Uh, and there's no action yet on the transfer of development rights, which is something which happens elsewhere and something we've got to get our head round in Hong Kong in order to deal with the private property rights of those who own heritage properties. And this is a comment on the government against private assets. We, as a foundation, and I think quite a lot of people in Hong Kong agree, believe that heritage assets should be held on long leases by those willing and qualified to operate, manage and maintain them to, in a pre-approved manner, in a way that the community thinks is a good way. And the mechanism is needed to compensate private owners for the loss or restriction of ownership rights that they may suffer because people don't want them, as has happened to, on several occasions, to demolish that rather valuable building, I mean, well, a building on a rather valuable site which could then be redeveloped into something a lot more dense in use, um, uh, quite common in Hong Kong. And it's a key issue for any holistic conservation policy, so that people think that if they are willing to conserve a private heritage asset, they may be compensated in some way for actually taking that action and giving up the amount of money they could earn if they sold it on. Possible solutions a surrender and grant of alternative site of equivalent, equivalent value, uh, a non-in-situ exchange. This has begun to happen, again, in Hong Kong. There's been one so far. Uh, but again, it's not a policy. It was a, a one-off action in response to a particular situation that arose. 
we could quantify the value of development rights and monetize these through the issues of what we call in Hong Kong letter C, because this was done on a previous occasion as letters A and B for a, another situation which needed looking at. And with ownership responsibility, staying with the heritage site, uh, with the owner of the original heritage site. But they could use those letters C to go and transfer that development right value uh, to somewhere else and buy into another development where they could realize some of the profits that they were foregoing. The approval of another alternative, approval of compensatory development on part of or on an adjoining site. That's also been considered in Hong Kong as a possibility uh, so that they, again, some compensation for the owner for actually retaining the heritage building. And there are now grants to assist with renovation and maintenance. This is something quite new for private assets and is something that needs to be extended, but I think that probably will come now. Just one case study to finish with. Um, some things do work in the end. The central police station is a complex of 19 buildings right in the heart of central on some of the most valuable and oldest land we have. And a proposal four or five years ago, the government wanted to take it the same way as the Marine Police Station put it out to tender to a developer who would then be entrusted with turning it into some sort of tourism centre. I think that was probably the first beginnings of people thinking in Hong Kong, is that really the way we want to go? And they decided, a lot of people objected to that particular approach. In fact, so many people objected in the end that government decided to go back and think again. Nothing much was done. There were several private proposals, but nothing went ahead. Until last year, when the Jockey Club put forward some proposals for the conservation of the entire project. Com uh, the complex, all buildings, and turning it into, I suppose, again, slightly aimed at tourism, but without <coughs> destroying the heritage, much, much more emphasis on, on the heritage side of things, and doing it in such a way that it would not be overwhelmed and just go to big businesses, because it was going to be renovated to a mix of uses that individuals and small organisations in Hong Kong could participate in, and it would be open to the public, which was very important to the people who were interested in this particular development. So, the previous proposals were privately owned, many tourism use did not find favour. Current, the Jockey Club current proposal it gives a much more emphasis to heritage, not so much focus on revenue generation. It will conserve existing character, by retaining all the listed buildings, and it adopts a comprehensive and integrated approach with new uses appropriate to the character and history of the site. It's proposing small-scale museums, small theatres, black box cinema, art and craft workshops and galleries, individual shops, cafes and bars, but no really large-scale now shopping, which was something a lot of people disliked about the original proposals. The impact proposed uses on traffic have yet to be considered. This is in one of the densest parts of Hong Kong with very narrow streets. So the, the scale has to be appropriate because people are going to have to walk there. And it's going to have to appeal to local residents and not just tourists, tourists because it's going to have to be used by the people who live round about it to a large degree. Any demolition or new building is subject to the standard town planning board process, which is something else everyone was quite keen to see. We still have problems with it. Uh, the height limit is still subject to discussion. Uh, the original proposals wanted to build a 150 metre high tower at the back, but I think the jockey club has been persuaded that probably wouldn't go down terribly well. And uh, they've now gone back to ask for some new designs. They have, though, under, during the year that this has been under discussion, written an excellent conservation management plan after the proposals were made, but it is there now, and it's a, a really good plan. Uh, but we still have no, got no statement of the cultural significance. So things from a heritage point of view are still being done rather back to front, but we are getting to a situation where we should be. That was just where we are at the moment. But as I say, all ideas and suggestions on how we might take things forward in Hong Kong would be very much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>